During this explanation and analysis of the ending of Bioshock Infinite, I'll be discussing in detail the ending of the game. That means spoilers. You have been warned. I have split the topics I wish to talk about into a few parts. They are all within this single video, but I just wanted to split a few things into manageable chunks to make life easier for both me and you. I also want to point out that I am not a professional speaker, nor a writer, nor do I have any extensive analysis skills. This is just my interpretation of the ending as well as combining some thoughts from other people as well. This video doesn't serve to break down every single frame of the ending. I expect if you're watching a video with a title like this you'll have at the very least witnessed the ending and as such I won't be explaining how the dimension and time jumps work or where it happens. The game does a good job of explaining the big picture details like that. If you haven't seen the ending or want a refresher I have linked below a video of the ending sequence, feel free to watch that to refresh your memory. So part 1. It's time travel, sort of. By the end of Bioshock Infinite you should be well aware that you are dealing with time travel here, but rather than just a to and from the same timeline deal, it's more like interdimensional jumping to and from entirely different timelines and dimensions. Do you follow? It confuses me, so it may confuse you. I made this to illustrate my point. I hope that's clear. Basically, they travel from one timeline's present to a different timeline's past and or future. There are characters in the game, namely Elizabeth and Lutece, who can open dimension gates known as tears. They can be opened momentarily to peek into an alternate dimension or they can be travelled to more or less permanently. There are also infinite permutations of these dimensions. What a coincidence that the game is called Bioshock Infinite, hmm? And while we're on the topic of Lutece being able to partake in some dimension jumping, in fact, you'll know I refer to them, it, as a singular person, Lutes. That's because it's revealed through audio logs that Lutes, the female one, is the original Lutes of this particular dimension. Her brother? He is also Lutes, but he's from another dimension. The permutation that we as a player get to experience is one where Lutes, a scientist, is female, but due to her own tinkering with time travel and dimension tomfoolery, they basically formed a duo, after having successfully managed to jump dimensions, they pass it off as being identical twins to associates, but as I said it was revealed that they are indeed the exact same person, just one is female and one is male. So moving on. Part 2. They are the same person. I don't mean Lutece again, I mean, well, if it wasn't clear, Booker DeWitt is Comstock. It's revealed in the final sequence of the game and is left unexplained as a way to shock and intrigue you and rightfully so. That doesn't mean we can't explain how they are one and the same. There are two timelines that we should consider here, we'll refer to them as A and B. Timeline A is where Booker becomes Comstock, how do you ask? Well now is the time for a story. Booker is a war veteran. Through post-traumatic stress and reasons, Booker has turned to alcohol and gambling to fill whatever gap may need filled. In this time he manages to accrue a very large sum of debt that he has to pay off. At some point he meets a man known as Lutes who offers in return for his child a large deposit of money that he could use to pay off his debts. Reluctantly, Booker accepts, his child is sold off to a rich industrialist and in return his debts can be paid off. The man he sold his child to? His name is Comstock. Now there's a reveal for you. How does that make sense? Well, remember when I said the game uses time travel in a way? And that the game accepts the theory that there can be thousands upon thousands of different permutations of parallel universes? Well, in true form there is a fork in the road for Booker somewhere in his life that causes a split to be made and hence two realities play out. In the years succeeding his military service to his country, he turns to religion to absolve him of his sins and depression, or at least that's one path. The other path is what leads us to where he has to sell his child, i.e. timeline B. So I made a diagram for that too, and here's Booker DeWitt's fork in the road. In an effort to absolve himself of sin and depression, he turns to religion, remember? Well, to do so, he goes in to get himself baptised, except at his baptism one of two things happen. Booker either accepts his baptism or Booker denies his baptism. If he accepts, he turns to God and as well changes his name and identity to Zachary Comstock. 
Now we'll get to the Comstock path in a moment, but let's just cover our bases here. The alternative is that Booker refuses his baptism, realising that having his head dipped in water was not going to wash away his problems, so to speak. So he leaves the baptism and remains as Booker. This is what leads to his alcohol and gambling abuse, as well as his debt and in turn selling off his child. In this timeline, Booker also scars the letters AD on his hand, which stands for Anna DeWitt which is Elizabeth's real name. So that explains that. Now how do they all tie together? Well, that's where I get to talk about Comstock. Part 3. Comstock So assuming we're following the reality wherein Booker accepts the Lord as his saviour and becomes Comstock through a change of name and identity, we can now look at how Comstock came to be who he is in the game. So let's get his personal life and his history out of the way first. Comstock is a man of industry. He is married to Lady Comstock and is friends with a brother and sister scientist duo known as the Lutesses. At some point, Comstock finds his way into becoming the mayor or governor of Colombia, and as he works with the Lutesses, he concocts the idea that he and Colombia want to secede from what is referred to as the Union, basically the United States. He wants Colombia to become its own sovereignty, basically. He wants to do this because he becomes somewhat of a religious zealot. He is obsessed with racial purity and reflects much of the 1920s America's point of view, where first class citizens were nothing short of purebred whites and others such as the blacks and Irish were considered second class citizens. This segregation is clear in the game and Comstock is rampant when it comes to pushing his agenda to the people of Colombia and much like our own reality, this religious tyrant has amassed a following as well as chained and mechanised the supposed lesser races. So now you understand just how bad Comstock has gotten, we can use this to explain and justify things a little later but first, let's address Colombia itself. The Lutesses are brilliant scientists, so they come up with technology that would allow Colombia to float in the sky, which gives way to not only the idea of it being like the common depiction of heaven above the clouds, but explains, in a way, why the whole city can exist in the first place. Now we can get to how this relates to Booker selling his child. Along the way, Comstock had been exposed to the Lutesses technology for a long time, which had rendered him sterile, basically he couldn't have children anymore meaning he couldn't have a reliable heir to his kingdom. So maddened by this fact, he comes up with the idea that he could go back in time, or rather back in time and to another dimension via the Lutesses, to buy his very own daughter from Booker, who is himself. So he sold his child to himself basically. Now the reason he wants to go for Elizabeth over any other child is because, again, it comes to this whole purity thing. He wants someone from his bloodline to take over the throne and continue to push his agenda. This obviously works out as now we have seen Booker does indeed sell his child in at least one permutation of reality, so Comstock has a hold of Elizabeth. What he doesn't know is that Elizabeth also shares the same powers that the Lutesses share, where she can open and close dimensional rifts. So to quell her powers, Comstock once again enlists the help of the Lutesses to come up with technology to stop her from using her powers to any great extent. This is where the siphon comes into play. You know, the huge speakers that are in Elizabeth's statue? Yeah, the Lutesses made this to stop her from using her powers. Another thing worth noting is how Lady Comstock is already dead by the time we get to Columbia. When Comstock bought Elizabeth, she was only one year old or younger, basically a newborn. This enraged Lady Comstock and she had assumed that Mr Comstock was cheating on her, so two things had to occur so that Comstock could keep up his image as well as maintain a blanket over the reality of Elizabeth's arrival on Columbia. Thing 1. Due to her sterility, Comstock claimed that Elizabeth had been a miracle birth and that she had grown in the womb of Lady Comstock in only seven days. This fabrication served to reaffirm his religious agenda and to correlate himself with stories from the Bible itself, as well as explaining how Elizabeth came to be. Thing 2. Comstock had to get rid of Lady Comstock so that she wouldn't reveal the truth behind Elizabeth's arrival. Remember, he bought a newborn child, that isn't good for PR. And so that Lady Comstock wouldn't be a problem, to do this, he had her assassinated and then blamed it on another character known as Daisy Fitzroy, who you'll remember as being the leader of the rebellion against Comstock, made up of mostly second class citizens such as the blacks and Irish. This served to enforce his belief in racial purity and paints these second class citizens in a negative light. So Comstock effectively killed two birds with one stone, so to speak, and no one ever questioned the mystery around the existence of Elizabeth, nor the death of Lady Comstock, and Comstock himself got to have his daughter back even if only in a limited capacity due to having her locked up. 
Another interesting point is that Comstock was such a smart man that he even came up with an almost foolproof plan in the event that somehow, someway, the booker from the timeline Comstock bought Elizabeth from would come back to get his daughter. He propagandised the idea that one day a false shepherd would come and lead his lamb astray. Basically, he says that one day a man may come and take Elizabeth and that man will have a scar on his hand. A scar that reads AD. Remember when I said Timeline B Booker scarred the initials of his child on his hand? Yup, it all ties together. So now that brings us to why Booker came to find himself on Columbia in the first place. Part 4. A Guilty Conscience After the Lutes twins had helped Comstock create Columbia, as well as coming up with the elaborate scheme which allowed him to get back and basically imprison Elizabeth, they were overcome with a sense of guilt. They are just scientists, they have a passion for tinkering and discovering new things, and certainly they had intended to use their science for good, but found themselves in a position where they were working for an evil man. In an effort to atone for the moral crimes which they helped make possible, they come up with their own plan to solve these issues and potentially restore order to the timelines. Once again, Lutes heads back to timeline B, where a broken down booker is still at ends with himself and looking for ways to pay off his debt. What job, you ask? Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. It's basically the opening of the game. You're led to believe you're to recover this girl, Elizabeth. Now at this point, Elizabeth is around 20 years old and Booker does not know that she is his daughter. To him, it's just a job. To Lutes, it's possibly a way to restore order. And to Elizabeth, it opens a path of discovery of not only who she is, but of her true identity. So now that I've explained what the final sequence basically implies and shown you my interpretation of it, the only thing left to discuss is the resolve, how this whole thing comes to an end. Basically, at one point, a multitude of different Elizabeths appear in front of Booker and they explain to him that there is in fact alternate branches to this path. One where he becomes Zachary Comstock and one where he remains as Booker DeWitt. The only way to cut this feedback loop is to effectively stop the branch from ever happening at all. And that's where this scene comes in. You were born again as a different man. It all has to end. To have never started. Not just in this world, but in all of ours. He's Zachary Comstock. He's Booker DeWitt. No. I'm both. And that's it. What started off as a broken man's journey through pain and suffering, to both acceptance and denial, through life as both a relatively good man and a terrifyingly evil man, a journey of discovery and understanding of just who you are and what you could potentially do given the choices you make. You could be a lowly man reduced to selling his child to pay off debt, or you could be an old man buying his child as a means to extend your oppressive religious propaganda. If there's one thing we learn from this game is that in life you may have a limited amount of choice, but the potential outcomes are infinite. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by, is a better Anna? Huh?